is these two guys right here, okay? They ran South Jamaica Queen during that heyday, you know, during the crack epidemic. Those two individuals right now, that's who they ran. That was Gerald Prince, the feared New York rapper's care. Once upon a time in the gritty streets of a bustling New York City, Gerald Prince Miller reigned. Behind his ominous moniker lay a story of power, loyalty, and fear. Gerald wasn't just any ordinary man. He was the nephew of the notorious Kenneth McGriff, a kingpin whose name struck terror into the hearts of many. But like every story of a criminal who felt they were untouchable, they of course came crashing down at some point. So the sad truth is that these guys had just a few years here and there of fame and fortune, and it cost them most of their entire adult lives in various jails and penitentiaries. But we'll get there in due time. For now, let's talk about Gerald Miller and his supreme gang. Gerald was said to be McGriff's right-hand man, the enforcer of his uncle's will, and wherever he roamed, fear followed like a shadow. His presence alone was enough to send shivers down the spines of even the bravest souls, for he commanded respect through sheer force and intimidation. Rappers who were shorties in the 1980s, otherwise known as the crack era, the time of the Supreme Team's reign and dominance, have name-checked the team's exploits in verse, and Queen's native 50 Cent shouted them out on 2000's Ghetto Quran, Yo, when you hear talk of the South Side, you hear talk of the Team C and feared Prince and respected Preemie for all you slow mo I'ma break it down iller. See, Preemie was the businessman and Prince was the K-Air. Raised in the unforgiving streets of Queens, Gerald learned early on that survival meant embracing the code of the streets. With McGriff as his mentor, he quickly rose through the ranks, becoming a force to be reckoned with. His mere presence instilled fear in those who dared to cross his path. But beneath the facade of intimidation lay a complex tale of family ties and the lure of the streets. Gerald's story is one of struggle and survival, navigating the treacherous waters of a world ruled by power and violence. As whispers of his deeds spread like wildfire through the streets, Gerald Prince Miller became a legend in his own right a figure both feared and revered in equal measure. And as his story unfolds, one thing becomes clear. In the world of the streets, loyalty is currency, and Gerald was its prince. Gerald Miller grew up in a tough neighborhood where family ties meant everything. His upbringing was deeply influenced by his family connections, especially to Kenneth McGriff, a prominent figure in the world of organized crime. McGriff was like a father figure to Miller, guiding him through the streets and teaching him the ways of the underworld. Miller's family ties to McGriff played a significant role in shaping his path towards becoming an enforcer in the world of organized crime. From a young age, he was exposed to the lifestyle of crime and violence, witnessing firsthand the power and respect that came with being associated with McGriff. Growing up, Miller looked up to McGriff and aspired to follow in his footsteps. He saw him as a role model, someone who could provide guidance and protection in a dangerous environment. McGriff's influence helped Miller establish himself within the criminal underworld, earning him a reputation as a formidable enforcer. Testimonies from those who crossed paths with Miller echoed similar sentiments. They spoke of his propensity for violence, recounting instances where he unleashed brutal retribution upon those who dared to defy McGriff's authority. His methods were ruthless and uncompromising, leaving a trail of broken bones and shattered spirits in his wake. Under the leadership of Kenneth Supreme, McGriff and Gerald Prince Miller, his nephew as second in command, the gang concentrated its criminal efforts on widespread drug distribution. Prime basically taught Prince everything he knows about the game, the Queen's insider says. The dynamic between Preme and Prince was one of big brother, little brother, with Preme being the older sibling. Even though Prince was Preme's nephew, Preme was only two years older, so in effect, they grew up as brothers with Supreme leading the way. Where Preme went, Prince followed. First they went into the five percenters, and then into the streets together. Being a 5%er was nothing more than a license to be brutal, 
rapper LL Cool J said. But in case you're wondering who the five percenters are and the origin of Prince criminal doings, here you go. Five percenters were an offshoot of the Nation of Islam, which started on Harlem streets in 1964 under the leadership of Clarence 13X Smith, a Korean War veteran and former member of the NOI's elite Fruit of Islam security force. The Five Percent Nation considered itself a religious and cultural movement directed toward young blacks, aiming to teach them the correct ways of Islamic life. Its name derived from the members' belief that 10% of humanity, the devils, controlled and exploited 85% of the poor and uninformed who hadn't received knowledge. The remaining 5% were those civilized people, also known as Muslims and Muslim sons, whose task was to educate fellow blacks in their true religion. The fiery teachings came slamming off the radio and boom boxes in the 1960s. It was hip-hop before hip-hop. The messages were delivered in a staccato street rap that mesmerized New York City youth. The black man is God, Clarence 13X told his people with a rhetoric that was something they had never heard before. His followers called him Father Allah and rejected the belief that Noe founder Wallace Fard was God. They were the five percent, they were the righteous, and they enacted a cultural movement for their people. When Supreme discovered the teachings of the five percenters, he began envisioning himself differently. Supreme got his name in 1971 from his affiliation with the five percent nation. Supreme got a name and a way of life. He didn't smoke, drink, or eat red meat in accordance with five percenter beliefs. He held to the other tenets of the faith in his own fashion, manipulating them to suit his circumstances. Sayyid's source, it really started with the five percenters. Primi and them were god buddies. That's like 1980, Bing says. They weren't really selling drugs at that time. It was a religious thing. With Primi embracing the movement, he used his influence to get other youngsters like his nephew Prince involved. Although God B and his brother Firstborn Prince recruited and organized us within the Five Percenter Nation, Preme created an underground economy for us to thrive and flourish off, Prince said. As street dudes came home from prison, they showed Preme the principles of the drug game, and Preme combined their knowledge with his Five Percenter ideology. Preme and his group of hustling Five Percenters started their own small operation down on the block where selling drugs was more of a movement than a business or game. They were like neighborhood superheroes, says LL Cool J, who was seen in a clip at Miller's birthday party in 1985. They're like the godfathers of Queens. But Premi's clique was conflicted about embracing both the five percenter ideology and the Queens underworld mentality. A lot of the brothers and sisters didn't like the idea that we hustled because it was contrary to the lessons, said the source. But the drug money in the early 1980s proved irresistible, and the crew began growing into its grandiose moniker. Preme attracted a lot of dedicated followers, but Prince was his most steadfast and die-hard supporter, always at his side and watching his back. With a master's degree in the drug game acquired under the tutelage of Ronnie Bumps, Pretty Tony, and Fat Cat, Premi's Game Point Average, GPA, was off the charts. Using this knowledge, Premi moved his crew off the block and into Baisley projects. Preme and them were from Baisley, said the source, so it was only logical that Baisley projects would become their headquarters. The gang concentrated its criminal efforts on the widespread distribution of crack coke. At its 1987 peak, the Supreme Team's receipts exceeded $200,000 a day, and the gang regularly committed acts of violence and M to maintain its stranglehold on the area's drug trade. If I was their age, I could have been on their level says Queensbridge native Nas, 48, who rapped about the Supreme Team on his 1994 debut album, Illmatic. These people were at the right place at the right time for the perfect storm. After McGriff went to jail in 1987, leadership of the Supreme Team was assumed by Gerald Prince Miller. 
Miller solidified his control by increasing the security force and employing it against rivals and against team members suspected of disloyalty. The Supreme Team's narcotics operations used dozens of employees, including layers of drug sellers, to insulate the gang leaders from street-level activity. Team members communicated using the 5%er Supreme Alphabet and Supreme Mathematics as secret codes to pass messages or inspire loyalty and rebellion. To thwart law enforcement efforts further, Miller used armed bodyguards and deployed sentinels with two-way radios on rooftops. The sophistication of the gang's operation enabled it to survive the periodic targeting of various members for prosecution by the New York City Police Department, NYPD, and the Queens County District Attorney's Office, collectively the state. In late 1987, however, while Miller was incarcerated on state charges, a task force of NYPD and Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, agents executed search warrants on a number of Supreme Team storage locations, drug outlets, and residences. Although the gang was tipped off about the raid shortly before it occurred and was able to remove 11 kilograms of coke and $200,000 from targeted premises, authorities nonetheless seized an array of weapons, narcotics trade hardware, photographs, documents, and instructional manuals on criminal conduct, as well as a kilogram of coke and thousands of dollars. Following that raid and his own arrest by federal agents, McGriff ordered that the gang's operations be shut down. When Miller was released from prison in the spring of 1989, he began to rebuild the Supreme Team and regained control of two of its most lucrative retail locations known as Spots. The reorganized gang under Miller included Arroyo as the second-in-command, Hunt as Miller's bodyguard, Ernesto Piniella as head of security, and Hale, Jimenez, and Julio Hernandez as security workers. Tucker and Coleman managed retail spots and supervised crews of workers. Longtime gang member David Robinson helped supervise the drug operations and kept records. Raymond Robinson assisted in arranging coke purchases, provided security during drug transactions, supervised the processing of coke into crack, and delivered crack to sales locations. The Supreme Team began to reclaim its hold on the area drug trade and built its gross receipts up to $10,000 a day. The substantive narcotics distribution charges against the present defendants focused on the period from December 1989 to March 1990, during which the state was monitoring the gang's activity with wiretaps. During that period, the Supreme Team conducted its business in the Baisley Park apartment of David Robinson's mother. Tucker, Coleman, and David Robinson would deliver to the apartment the monies received at the retail spots they supervised. Miller and the team's primary drug courier, Trent Morris, would negotiate coke deals by telephone with William Graham, a supplier who had Colombian connections. And Morris and Raymond Robinson would then drive to Graham's apartment with money to purchase kilogram quantities of coke. The coke would be brought back to the Robinson apartment, where it was processed as crack, packaged, and given to Arroyo, David Robinson, Tucker, or Coleman, who in turn arranged for its sale by street-level employees. To obtain that information, Miller sought the help of two corrupt New York State Parole Division employees, Parole Officer Ina McGriff, no relation to Kenneth McGriff, and Secretary Ronnie Younger. Ina McGriff was responsible for supervising the parole of Supreme Team Security Chief Ernesto Piniella, but had become romantically involved with him. Younger had become romantically involved with Miller. The team regularly paid both women for assistance. For example, McGriff falsely certified that Piniella was in compliance with parole requirements. She and Younger provided the gang leaders with information from their parole files, false identification documents, and information about the whereabouts of other parolees. And McGriff, who as a parole officer carried a gun, supplied Supreme Team members with ammunition. 
particularly chilling evidence emerged when a former parole officer for a gang member testified that after developing a personal relationship with the gang member, she and a clerk in her office were paid by Mr. Miller to provide the address of another drug dealer. Piniella and Ina McGriff testified that Miller paid the two women $3,000 for the addresses for the two Boldens and their families. Handwritten notes of such addresses were recovered in a raid of a Supreme Team apartment. The notes were written in part by Younger, according to a handwriting expert's testimony, and in part by Ina McGriff, according to her own testimony. The notes provided Henry Bolden's address in the Bronx, where he was later shot, and they provided Isaac Bolden's mother's address, in the immediate vicinity of which he was later shot and unalived. The parole officer and the clerk are now in prison after pleading guilty to racketeering charges. Miller and the then-incarcerated McGriff ordered at least eight homicides. Prince Miller was able to beat multiple M charges but was still sentenced to six concurrent life sentences plus 20 years in 1993 for drug trafficking. Currently, Prince is serving seven life sentences at USP Allenwood in Pennsylvania and Supreme is serving life at USP Lee in Virginia. In the end, the story of Gerald Prince Miller, nephew of the infamous Kenneth McGriff, serves as a powerful reminder of the complexities of life in the streets. Through his role as McGriff's enforcer, Gerald wielded influence and instilled fear, carving out his own legend in the annals of urban folklore. Yet beneath the facade of power and intimidation lies a tale of human struggle and resilience. Gerald navigated a world fraught with danger and temptation, bound by ties of family and loyalty. His journey speaks to the universal themes of survival and the pursuit of identity in the face of adversity. As the curtains draw to a close on Gerald's story, his legacy endures as a cautionary tale and a testament to the enduring allure of the streets. His name echoes through the alleys and boulevards, a reminder of the price one pays for power and the sacrifices made in its pursuit. Their tale is one of turns, twists, and fate, but their influence and relevance has left a lasting impression. The drug game influenced the style and swagger of street culture, hip-hop, and gangster rap, and made the supreme team icons in the annals of gangster lore. Gerald Prince Miller may have been feared by many, but his story reminds us that behind every enigmatic figure lies a complex narrative of humanity, woven with threads of ambition, loyalty, and ultimately, the search for meaning in a world where survival is the ultimate prize.